Well, ladies and gentlemen, can I sort of welcome you to our Parliament, those of you who haven't been here before? Um, I, th I think I, when I came here, I came with a pretty voluminous talk, which uh, would have just been about acceptable, I think, in a comfortable room when you're all sitting down. But I fear may strain your patience if I read it or anything approximate to read it. So you're going to get a very uh, discursive version of something that had been quite carefully thought through. So I apologize for the, you know, the summer evening, the lack of seats, the being under the flight path to Heathrow and all the other environmental add-ons that we've created for you. Um, but, but what I really want to address is one of the underlying themes of what I and my colleagues are trying to do in government, which is uh, creating a knowledge economy. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the UK system, um, my department is called BIS, which is Business Innovation and Skills. And what we're talking about in this conference covers at least the last two, and well, in fact all three of them, but with the particular focus on innovation. And I'm very indebted to Mariana and indeed some of her associates for the kind of creative thinking that's gone on in this whole ed era and which we want to learn from. I think what came through from her writing uh, as a very strong theme um, is the idea of the state uh, as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, going rather contrary to the sort of conventional view about what government should do. And I think the point has to be reinforced and understood that many of the things which we take for granted, you know, around the internet, around nuclear power, around pharmaceuticals, split exploration, computers, uh, could not have happened had government, with a small g, not been actively involved in promoting and investing in these things. Um, I think in her book, uh, The Entrepreneurial State, she points out that the Medical Research Council, which is one of our kind of world-class uh, research funding institutions, uh, put money into monoclonal an an antibodies uh, 30 years ago, which actually now formed the basis of our uh, pharmaceutical industry, about a, a third of all new drug treatments. And that came from original enlightened uh, government investment. And I think one of the things that we have to do uh, is to counter some of the myths around what government can and should do. I think I probably have quoted, and indeed many politicians do, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan's um, little quote about, you know, the government's, um, the worst words in the English language are that the government's here and we're trying to help. And we tend to use it rather satirically uh, to dismiss, um, you know, government and in ambition and intervention. But it is worth recalling that, of course, under the Ronald Reagan administration, some of the best government initiatives in the United States happened as the Small Business Research in Innovation, SBRI, which we're now trying to adapt in the United Kingdom. Uh, I mean, I suppose one could argue that Star Wars didn't result in any uh, lasers being actively used in space against the Soviet Union, but nonetheless it spawned a whole generation of innovation that has been enormously valuable. But I think that example is also a warning of erring too far in the other direction. I mean, the Soviet Union is no longer with us, and one of the reasons it's no longer with us is that it had a very top-heavy, bureaucratic, state-dominated system that suffocated innovation. Uh, and we've got many examples in our own country and others of governments in the past uh, developing a certain level of hubris about their own capacity to make choices. Indeed, we, we, we're still recovering in the UK from the reputation of governments making bad choices. The, fa the uh, fashionable example is always Concord or the earlier generation of Zeta in, in nuclear fusion. And a whole generation grew up with this phrase, picking winners, applied usually in a very pejorative way. And I think we've rethought that and we've gone back to, I think, a more balanced approach. But, I mean, the central point to make is that we do need uh, a, a recognition of the positive role that the state can play in innovation with also a recognition of its limits and of the need for the state to be an entrepreneur but also the private sector. 
But let me bring that to what I'm trying to do and what my government's trying to do in this space. Uh, I think people who are concerned with this agenda, Mariana uh, and others, are rightly uh, constructively critical about what we're trying to do. And I think we'll always argue we could do a lot more. And I hope that in this conference we'll learn more about uh, how we could do more. But I think there are some initiatives that we are taking which address the agenda you've set and which will, I think, stand the test of time. I think, first of all, we have rec recognized that government has a key role in financing the valley of death problem, recognizing that the private sector will not by itself take responsibility for risk in innovation. We've got, now got a British business bank, one of two state banks that have been created in my department, the other to do with green technologies and which directly finance uh, business, uh, mainly loan to some extent equity. Uh, secondly, we've established a network of what we call catapults, which are loosely based on the Fraunhofer model uh, of Germany, but it's applied in a UK context. And uh, Ian Grace here for the Technology Strategy Board who oversees that operation. Uh, we've now got seven of these. Uh, they've been rolled out at about two a year, very fast, I think are making a massive impact in building that link between science and application in business, which has often been very deficient in the UK. And I think an overarching idea that we have developed is what I call the industrial strategy. This is trying to think on a partnership basis with business, trying to think long term. We've now got uh, 10-year programs for aerospace, for the automotive industry, energy supply chains, um, what will happen from the supply chain spillouts of nuclear power, for example, as that comes on stream, but also key uh, service sectors like creative industries. And sitting down planning long-term government with the private sector, uh, looking at requirements for access to finance, for training, government procurement strategies, and the rest of it. And then I think in terms of science, we've recognized that even in a very brutal environment for public spending, and we have been through a very torrid period since the financial collapse, I mean, many countries have done so. Ours in the UK was particularly severe. We had the biggest drop in output of any major industrial countries. It was reflected in the shock to our budget. We had a 10% of GDP budget deficit when I came into office. So been, it's been pretty brutal in terms of public spending, but despite that, we have identified key areas of which science spending is one, which have been protected through ring fencing. And the innovation work of the Technology Strategy Board, we've sort of massively increased their resources over the last few years. Having said all that, I haven't come here just to read a telephone directory of all the good things we've done in government. I'm sure you will all say we should be doing differently and we should be doing more. But, but what I want to use that is a peg uh, for arguing not just that it would be nice to do more, that we actually need to do a lot more. And there is now a powerful evidence base to suggest that this is something that if governments want to be taken seriously in the knowledge economy context, they have to do more. And just to review the key premises here, first of all, um, a lot of evidence that science and innovation is absolutely critical to economic growth. A lot of empirical evidence, certainly in the UK, between 2000 and 2008, about a third of all the growth in the economy stemmed from science and innovation, to the extent to which economists can isolate these different factors. Uh, we now have in the UK economy what we call a productivity puzzle. I don't think it's a puzzle at all. It's the after effects of a major economic shock and recession. But you know, whatever the underlying causes of it, we recognize that there is a deep structural problem of low productivity in the UK, which has to be addressed through innovation. We've, uh, we're looking across countries. Uh, firms that invest more in R&D typically have a significantly higher level of productivity than those which don't invest to anything like the same extent. The second premise is that if we consistently invest less in R&D and innovation than competitor countries, we will simply not be able to sustain the position that we have. I mean, I think you could argue that in many respects the UK 
is already punching well below, well beyond its weight. Uh, and that will be very difficult to sustain without uh, continued government support, or in, indeed in large government support. We have about 4% of the world's researchers, and that 4% generates about 6% of all academic articles in the scientific space, about 12% of citations, and about 16% of the most highly cited articles. And we're not going to be able to maintain that unless the base from which it comes is significantly larger. And I just acknowledge that um, R&D investment in the UK over quite a long period has been falling quite some way behind um, comparable countries. Um, in the 1990s, 1980s, and indeed in the last decades, um, total investment in R&D in the UK is about 1.7% of, of, of GDP. Uh, that compares with the US, which is close to three, uh, China, which is now about the UK level but surpassing it, and of course in a much bigger economy, South Korea, 4%, Germany, 3%. So we simply don't have the investment, and <laughs> over the last few decades we haven't had the kind of investment to sustain the quality of output that we need. And compared with some of the smaller European countries, we're well behind. If you take... Um, Innovation, in contrast with Finland, which is in some sense of a role model in this area, Finland spends about 10 times what we do on the equivalent of Ian Gray's institution, the Technology Strategy Board, a great institution in the UK, and we're putting a lot more money into it, but we start from a very, very low base. Uh, the third premise, uh, building on the second, is that uh, alongside uh, tax incentives, uh, public investment, is absolutely crucial to mobilizing private investment in R&D. And there is a lot of evidence that these two things are correlated, that public investment crowds in private investment. It doesn't do the opposite, as is often argued. The two things go very closely together. Some recent research by Alan Hughes and Jonathan Haskell argues, for example, that willingness to pay public research funding leverages complementary funding from private and other sources. The two things go together. And then fourth and finally um, is that what we have done has worked. We have got a significant payback from what we actually do. And again, a lot of research suggests, for example, that the survival um, of individual companies is massively increased by R&D commitments. The social returns on what government has done are extremely high uh, for every pound we spend delivers an average social return of about 20 to 50 pence, depending on the particular intervention. The TSB um, invests, gets a return to the economy, about three to nine pounds of additional value from every pound it spends. A massive amount of evidence that we get a very high um, economic and social return from what we actually do. And the conclusion, therefore, has to be um, is that we've got to do more. Now, you can imagine that my, this particular passage had a few uh, fraught moments in my conversations with the Treasury, but um, <laughs> I think it has to be said uh, that if we are going to uh, um, underline the strength of the economy, uh, make us less vulnerable, catalyze private sector investment, uh, we have to have substantial public investment in research and development and innovation. That's the main conclusion. Now, on the back of that, um, one or two announcements I can make which show the direction in which we're trying to travel. Uh, just I'll itemize one or two things which I think indicate the commitment we're trying to make in very difficult conditions. First of all, uh, a significant new investment uh, announced today, the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council, uh, two programs worth uh, 30 million involving 11 universities, 30 businesses, uh, Rolls-Royce, Tata Steel, GKN. Um, and essentially what they're doing is developing much more powerful and efficient aero engines, and this is linked back into our industrial strategy. Secondly, we have um, made a commitment through a group of UK researchers to create a virtual library of pharmaceutical compounds that have stalled. There is a lot of uh, interesting research that was done into products that never, never matured, never saw the light of day, never saw... Um, practical applications, and these are now being uh, collated 
um, and repurposed and a major collaboration is taking place with government support through the Medical Research Council uh, with AstraZeneca in particular. Uh, thirdly, I have a, um, a new Life Sciences Minister appointed last week, as off to Norwich tomorrow, opening a big new development in Norwich, the so-called Centrum Building, which is bringing ma major investment in biosciences. But I do recognize, and it goes back to the argument I've been advanced, that we should be doing a lot more. And if I were to put something concrete, I would say that if we were really to be taken seriously as a country, we probably need to be thinking of spending roughly double what we do on innovation and research. Uh, it's, a, it's a quantum leap. It's not just a, a bit of incremental growth. Uh, and you know, this would enable us, for example, to do very substantially more in relation to the kind of thing the TSB are doing, improving the success rate for the SMART grants to uh, practical innovations. Currently, success rate's about 25% for applicants. It enable us to do much more in terms of catapults, um, but, but generally making a very a, a significantly larger government contribution to public investment in R&D. And, uh, and, you know, and I say that with all the qualifications we have to make about public sector financing and how do we balance this off against uh, other public expenditure commitments and tax. Just one final set of thoughts, if I might, and I'm sorry I've strained your patience a little bit by going on so long, but I, I think the, the other big theme that I hope this conference will develop is the importance of long-termism in thinking. I've already mentioned this in the context of the industrial strategy. One of the things, uh, one of the serious problems we have in the UK is of financial markets, which have historically been very short-term in their uh, outlook, which seek very short-term terms of return from innovation, affects takeover behavior, many other things. One of the earlier um, things I did in my job was to ask Professor John Kay, who probably some of you have heard of, to work with a team of people, including John Rose from Rolls-Royce and others, to look at this whole issue about long-termism in business decision-making, particularly financial markets, and how you change that. Uh, and the immediate results are not very tangible, but we are now beginning to see an impact. For example, we've now got a redefinition of the fiduciary duty of financial institutions like pension funds. They now have a clear long-term mandate. I made it clear two weeks ago that we are now going to look at the way the takeover panel approaches um, big corporate takeovers, and they will have a clear long-term mandate in evaluating what they do. The industrial strategy incorporates long-term thinking. The new competition authority, the CMA, has a long-term mandate. These things will take time to percolate through into business decisions, but over the medium and long term, this will really matter. And there is one particular intervention we're making, which is in relation to financial markets. We do recognize that for a very long period in the UK, and this goes back to the 1920s, if not before, a chronic shortage of capital for growth companies, particularly medium-sized companies, the British middle stand, if you like, uh, getting both equity and loan for the long periods of time. Getting a 10-year ten, ten bond for a British growth company, an innovating company, has been horrendously difficult. We're now beginning to change that. The business bank uh, is, is pulling a lot of these threads together. We've established through it um, a state, effectively, venture capital company. Uh, which is providing about 125 million. Again, it's small in relation to the economy, but it's growing rapidly. Uh, we've got another uh, fund called Enterprise Capital Fund, which is focusing particularly on uh, technology-related projects. We've got a biomedical catalyst, 180 million fund, which again is providing risk capital to that sector. So an absolutely key theme in what we're trying to do is to change the nature of financial markets in such a way that high-risk, long-term investment can flourish, and we recognize that without government capital and without government acting as a catalyst, these things will not happen. But thank you very much for your patient attention. Uh, I hope I've given you a bit of an indication of 
what we're trying to do in government. I hope you agree that at least the direction of travel is right, even if we haven't yet been able to deliver all the things that we would love to do. Thank you.